Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Fonta Gam, and I lead our work with the investment community at RFK Human Rights, and we are really excited about our book club conversation today. We host these quarterly book club conversations to engage our members, amplify social justice activists, authors, and journalists, and provide a deep dive into our shared work. This month, we are really excited to be joined by Kate Crawford to discuss her book, Atlas of AI, which highlights the political, ethical, and environmental costs of using artificial intelligence. As a leading international scholar of the social implications of artificial intelligence, Crawford showcases the power of AI to widen inequity and narrow divergent political ideologies. At RK Human Rights, we too recognize the intersection of tech and rights, especially the rise of AI and its impact on people, the planet, and society. Through our business and human rights department and our work with the investment community, we're excited to dig into this at our upcoming fall summit on AI, ethics, and investments on November 30th in New York City, and we hope you will join us. It is my pleasure to now pick up the conversation by introducing the moderator of the conversation, Michael Schreiber, the Chief Operating Officer at RFK Human Rights. Thank you, Fanta. <clears throat> and uh, this is this is the real me. This is not uh, an AI generated avatar. And I'm I'm thrilled to be able to welcome everybody to to today's conversation. Um, and you know, most uh, Professor Kate Crawford, who is joining us, is is a leading scholar on the social implications of artificial intelligence. She's a re researcher and professor at USC Annenberg in Los Angeles a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research in New York, an honorary professor at the University of Sydney, and the inaugural visiting chair for AI and justice at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. Her latest, Her latest book, book, which we'll be discuss, dis discussing today, is The Atlas of AI, and I, I hope that many of you on the call had the chance to to read but that the, the book recently won the Sally Hacker Prize um, from the Society for the History of Technology, the ASISNT Best Information Science Book Award, and was named one of the best books in 2021 by New Scientist in the Financial Times. Uh, she has advised policymakers in the United Nations, White House, and the European Parliament, and currently leading the Knowing Machines Project, an international research collaboration that investigates the foundations of machine, of, of machine learning. And it is my pleasure to, to welcome Kate to the discussion with us today. Hi, Michael. It's lovely to be here. Excellent. Well, I thought, you know, if we could just open up, uh, I, I know that many of the people on the call had the opportunity to to read the book, uh, but, you know, just a, a little bit of just background on, you know, kind of how how that book came to be and kind of what what motivated the, you know, kind of the topic selection and the kind of the the way in which you, you, you structured uh, the book itself. Mm, happy to do so. And it's interesting, of course, we're having this conversation at a moment of extraordinary change in artificial intelligence. It's it's really been a year of a inflection point with the emergence of generative AI like ChatGPT or DALL-E or Stable Diffusion, all now being used by hundreds of millions of people every day. So we're seeing these systems impact on our institutions, on our democracies, on our everyday life. But for those of us who've been studying and working with artificial intelligence for a long time, we had a bit of a heads up that this was coming. And certainly that was the focus of this book in particular, which is that many people think of AI as being somehow the stuff of science fiction. You know, it's HAL 9000, it's algorithms in the cloud, it's abstract mathematical representations. But actually, AI is a profoundly material technology with, with really far-reaching impacts on human beings and on the planet. So what I wanted to do was to really go and figure out what AI is made of in the fullest sense. And that meant going on these field trips around the world to go to the mines where the minerals are extracted to make these large-scale data centers, to go to the places where human labor is used to annotate all of these gigantic data sets, and also to go and see all of the different types of practices that go behind the data extraction that is used to make these systems work. So in doing this, I sort of looked at a three-part taxonomy for how AI is made. Data, 
labor, and natural resources. And that same formula applies today uh, in generative AI. Of course, Atlas of AI came out now almost two years ago, but that formula is identical. It's just that generative AI uses 10 times the amount of each, 10 times more data, more labor, and has 10 times at least the environmental impact and carbon footprint. So it really is an important moment to start thinking about how we use AI, where we use it, and if it's having these unseen impacts and, and, and consequences, which will come back to haunt us later if we're not aware of them. Excellent, thank you. That uh, you know, I want I want to start you know the 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 conversation with uh, the definition of intelligence itself, and I, I think you you cite uh, Dreyfus in the book and make the point that you know human intelligence relies heavily on both conscious and subconscious thoughts and activity and process, um, whereas you know the artificial intelligence really requires formalization, and I think you know that's. A, a fairly descriptive statement. It's hard to say whether that should be something that you look at with uh, hope or with caution. And and I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on you know kind of what what is the dynamic of that difference of intelligence uh, and and how that plays out um, through through the AI applications. I love this, Michael. You've just taken us right into the deep end at the beginning. And I, I love it because one of the more controversial statements that I make in this book coming from all of this research is that AI is neither artificial nor intelligent. So let me explain what I mean by that. We've talked a little about the enormous environmental footprint, the minerals, the energy in the water that drives AI. This is the opposite of artificiality. This is like profound materiality. But when we talk about intelligence, we have to think about what exactly do we mean there? And it's interesting because, of course, Hubert Dreyfus was very ahead of the curve. Back in 1972, he writes this wonderful book called What Computers Can't Do, The Limits of Artificial Intelligence. And in this book, he effectively describes how AI is always going to be fundamentally limited in terms of its ability to replicate human intelligence and common sense reasoning. Because essentially human intelligence is always grounded in embodied experience and situated in a context and often relational. Like today, we're talking to each other, we're in conversation, we're swapping ideas, we're changing our thinking, we're changing our opinions as we go. That isn't something that computers could do in that same way. They don't have embodied experience and they don't have that same form of context-based reasoning and relationality. Also, let's be frank, human cognition is so much more than formal rules and algorithms. We have intuition, we have learning, we have forms of relational sense. We can intuit about ambiguous or incomplete information. These are things which have been extremely difficult for AI systems to do effectively. So it's interesting if we look at the time that's passed since that book was written, I think this lesson still hasn't been learned. In so many ways, there's a tendency for current AI systems to be seen as magical, as somehow able to you know, essentially, essentially give us the answer to any question, to intervene in any context and be reliable. But for those of us who've been diving deep into how these systems work, I'm acutely aware of how they fail us, of the ways in which they're not reliable, of the impacts they can have and the forms of discrimination that they can actually backstop if people assume that they're working somehow with objective or neutral systems. These are anything but. Thank you. That's and you 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 referenced in in that answer the the natural and the impact on on the environment and you know really the 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 framework of an atlas where you take us on a a tour around the world and whether it's the the lithium mines in Nevada or the latex in Malaysia you know you kind of show the the kind of the massive world spanning impacts um, and then kind of taking that and recognizing that uh, that that humans are very bad at giving up uh, conveniences and new discoveries that uh, become part of our lives. I guess it leads to a question of, you know, what what do you see the prospects for the environment as we go forward, given what has unfolded already and kind of the, the, the challenges that we have kind of undoing the things, even once we all collectively agree that, you know, plastic bottles are, are a net negative for the world and a convenience that there's many other options for. And yet we still have, 
you know, however many billions of bottles being, uh, you know, produced every year. So what what does the, the the look forward for the environment kind of given the positioning of AI today? Mm. Well, I love that you've used the example of plastic bottles because we can use that as a as a case study of a consumer convenience that was produced in a very widespread way in the 20th century without a lot of thought about what would happen to these sorts of negative externalities of mass use. In many cases, we just hadn't done the research to see how incredibly impactful and negative plastic bottles are going to be. We're at a point in the hype cycle of artificial intelligence, where it's all about, let's put an LLM on it. Let's shove in some form of generative AI to everything without thinking about the long-term consequences. I think this is one of the most important untold stories about AI. And that's why it's so important that we discuss it now. Because if we don't change the way we're building generative AI, it is going to leave the most horrifying environmental legacy. So it's urgent that we intervene now at the beginning of this enormous cycle, rather than waiting to see the damage at the end, as we did with plastic bottles. Let me give you some concrete examples. So we've had three studies now that have looked side by side at generative AI systems and traditional, say, search algorithms. Depending on the study, it's anywhere between 14 to 50 times more computationally intense to run a generative AI LLM, large language model, rather than just say using a traditional search system. So that means we're actually impacting the planet every time we play with these systems. And many times we're not even using them as real tools. We're just mucking around with chat GPT without seeing this enormous planetary extractive system that we're bringing into being every time we use these systems. So your question is, can we do this differently? Can we do it better? The answer is we have to, and there's lots of ways we can do it. So again, if we're looking at current studies on water consumption. We've seen that all of the major tech companies building generative AI have increased their water consumption almost up to 40% in a year, threatening the, the groundwater and drinking supplies of entire towns. And that's just here in the United States. We could think about this being, you know, multiplied across the world where fresh water is, you know, in such short supply, and we're using it to call these giant AI computational stacks. That's a major problem. There are ways of making these systems far less energy intensive, less compute intensive, and less water intensive, but it hasn't been prioritized. Why? Because we're in a race, because we're seeing all of these tech companies essentially try to be first to the gate. And that means they're emphasizing scale and just throwing as much compute at a problem as they can without thinking about the environmental downsides. So that's why as a public and democratic issue, we really have to start prioritizing and asking for some transparency and accountability around the environmental impacts of generative AI. I mean, until very recently, most people were unaware that it had such a negative impact. So even just that awareness is an important step. Excellent, and that's that's a great, uh you know, lead in one of the elements that you highlight uh, that, that I think is not so much AI, it's more just kind of global economics is the, the, the you know, mining and extraction and other things being kind of viable economic entities only because of a mispricing of the kind of the, the underlying asset. And that, that, you know, I think continues to, to be the case, though there may be some baby steps in the environmental space, many of the, the people who are joining us today uh, come from the investment community, uh, asset managers, and are very familiar with hearing ESG. But the, the S piece, which Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights spends a lot of its energy on, is even more mispriced or underpriced than, than the environmental. There is no today equivalency of carbon emissions and measurement and you know secondary markets for a lot of the social outcomes. And so I, I was curious, you know, you, you highlight, um, you know, the mechanization of employees and you talk a bit about the kind of the, the robotic perfection being applied to, you know, human labor. Uh, you know, what, what do you think about the kind of pathway forward for, for labor as we look at this kind of AI impact, both on the, the, the work done directly in an automated and, 
computerized fashion, but also the work done by the humans in order to support that or alongside that? And what 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 does the future of labor look like given the kind of world we're in with artificial intelligence? Mm. Well, it's interesting because this is something I've studied for a long time. And certainly in the book, you know, dedicated a chapter to labor for this very reason that in some ways, I think we're echoing the, you know, the the early decades of the Industrial Revolution, where you see this gigantic shift from uh, an agrarian and, you know, farming-based economies into factory production. And you see this enormous loss of autonomy on the part of workers. You see them being put into these highly dangerous, highly mechanized environments. And we're seeing something very similar right now. There's been an enormous shift in just the last 15 years away from people who had salaried, reliable positions with knowable hours, with perhaps, you know, some form of healthcare support, and an enormous shift from that into what we call precarious labor. And a lot of that precarious labor is people holding down multiple jobs, multiple casual, or in, in many cases, online-based forms of work. And that is feeding into AI systems. And interestingly, in just the last 12 months, we've seen the emergence of a whole new category of human labor called reinforcement learning with human feedback or RLHF. Now, RLHF is the secret source behind ChatGPT, for example. So you have people who are essentially prompting these models, seeing if the answers are problematic or incorrect, and then trying to fix them. That is an enormous amount of workers, generally in the global south, and often being paid well below poverty levels. In fact, we've looked at sort of multiple studies across the world. The average pay scale for that type of you know, click work or crowd labor, depending how you define it, is a less than $2 an hour US, and that's in the most reliable companies. So you're looking at the expansion of this underclass of AI laborers who are, you know, some of the most exploited workers. I mean, certainly we could also look at what's happening in the actual mines themselves, which is, you know, even more horrifying. But certainly we could think about this as the bottom of the computational stack of laborers. So in many cases, Tech workers are not aware that, you know, when they send out an LLM to be, you know, addressed by their RLHF workers, that these are people who are often, you know, working in crowded basements with, you know, no support, with very little pay coming in. So even bringing these issues into the forefront of people's consciousness, making that hidden supply chain of labor visible is the first step. And then after that, we have to make sure that this is premised on a much stronger foundation of human rights and equitable labor conditions. Excellent. Well, that, that's going to make me feel a little guiltier about my next question, because I think uh, we 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 took the, the task and asked uh, chat GPT to generate uh, what it thought would be a great question. And I now know that I'm using water, electricity and subminimum wage uh, energy and resource to do that. So I mm -hmm. I, I will. I will try to offset all of those wrongs uh, after the call, but but uh, here here's what ChatGPT thought uh, we should ask. It says, uh, Kate Crawford's Atlas of AI raises crucial ethical and societal concerns surrounding artificial intelligence. How do examples and analyses presented in the book impact your understanding of the intersection between technology and society? What are the most pressing ethical considerations that emerged for you? And how do they reflect or challenge your previous perceptions of AI's role in our lives? So that's ChatGPT's question. And my question for you is, you know, what what do you what can you say or what insight can you share about the the data harvesting that ChatGPT went through in order to generate that question? Mm. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Let's let's have a look at what ChatGPT left out. Of course. Everything about the environment is gone in that question. We're just talking about humans and technology. Fair enough. That's, you know, a good third of the book. So it's not entirely wrong, but it's an extremely generalized account. So I think even at the sort of the first level, we can see that as a type of, you know, response from chat GPT, eh, I give it a B minus. <laughs> no, it's not a particularly good one. And that's interesting too, because I think we rely on these systems thinking that they're somehow going to be giving us something that that a human couldn't do or something that you hadn't already thought of. And I don't think that falls into that question. It, it, it shows the inadequacy of some of these models. But let's talk about how they work. So for chat GPT to even be able to do that, First of all, it had to be trained on an enormous corpus of data. We're talking about 
training data sets, as they're called, the size of the internet. And these are huge training data sets that are literally just created by scraping everything, like Reddit forums, you know, teen chat sites, the New York Times, um, sort of strange fringe political groups, um, weird conspiracy memes. They're all in there. And it's all put on a level par. There's no sense of this is better content, this is worse content. It's really just a grab bag of everything. So there's a lot of questions that you might want to ask from, you know, the ethical and political aspects, but you can also start to think about what happens with that training data set. So the way large language models work is in many ways, not about language at all. It's about probability. These are effectively next word or even next token predictors. So it's got this huge collection of words and phrases, and it's doing a probabilistic analysis on if you say Atlas of AI, what's the next most likely word to come next? So it's not even coming from a framework of a linguistic paradigm of understanding. It's purely probabilistic. And that means it only works if you have a vast amount of text, but even then, you can start to see in the answers why they're never really complete. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always sort of testing ChatGPT to say, oh, you know, give me an example. Today, I was I was looking at the history of, of, of mapping and I was like, give an example of, you know, six leading figures in critical cartography. Gave two and then four were completely made up because it's looking at these kinds of predictions of text rather than using a model of, okay, this is a reliable website or this is Wikipedia and therefore it's you know more believable than say a year 10 essay. Um, it, has, it has none of those sorts of paradigms for quality. Now those things may come, but we're at a very early stage where these systems are quite awkward and the only way that they're being improved is by throwing ever more data which means ever more compute. So you can see how these problems actually start to compound upon each other, the issues of data extraction and then the compute to run that data and then the energy and the carbon footprint of those systems and then the labor needed to try and rein in some of the worst and most dehumanizing answers that you might get from these systems. It's all deeply connected. You know, it's it's interesting. I think of the... Uh... You know, kind of the the early automobile innovation and where there was so much uh, energy and insight that went towards electric motor, but it got quickly shoved aside by the the uh, the kind of normal engines that we we see today and the internal combustion and really kind of stymied any investment and development of electric vehicles for you know uh, almost 100 years and I, i'm curious if you know your thoughts on you, you know you mentioned the the kind of statistically probabilistic as opposed to the kind of i'm not sure what the the right description of kind of a a, a linguist uh you know kind of a syntax structured you know knowledge rich verified source model where where there had been energy going the, does does the the kind of the the world we're in today kind of crowd out these other things, or is there room for a parallel development? Uh, uh, you know, or 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 will we have to wait until the world gets to such a massive problem that they go back and say, "Well, you know, we were actually on to something before this. Let's go back." Well, you know, it's it's really interesting because absolutely, there's always room for parallel development, you know, in the world, and certainly lots of researchers are looking at how to combine the statistical probabilistic approaches with what are called expert systems or rules-based approaches in AI, which really, as you say, were at the very foundation in the 1950s and 60s. It was just really cumbersome back then, and they didn't have anywhere near enough compute to make it work. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that right now the kind of hot research conversation is we're hitting the limits of what this LLM statistical approach can do. How do we start to bring back deep contextual expert and knowledge-based systems into the mix because this just is going to start setting us off, basically setting us off on the wrong path. So the, the big context question here, and this is you know particularly for your investors on the call, the context is what's getting supported. And at the moment, we are looking at one of the most concentrated industries of all time. 
So really, you'd have to go back to standard oil to see something similar in terms of just like the tiny number of industrial leaders that are are really generating uh, these new AI systems and profiting from it. So because of that, there is this enormous industrial control over how AI is being developed. So that can mean that you start to see these real skews as we did with the car. I mean, the, you know, the first cars, the first police cars, interestingly, were all electric. Um, and when we just completely lost that that capacity because of an industrial hyper focus that was not, you know, was, was oriented all around, you know, gas driven engines. So we have another moment here, which is, can we imagine a richer ecology that had more players and more focus on the impact of these systems rather than a tiny, we're talking about, you know, really depending how you count, fewer than six companies doing this and, and hoping that they do the right thing. I mean, that that's really not a recipe for good governance or for good civil society going forward. Well, yeah, thank you for that. And I hope, I hope that I know there are a number of investors who have uh, exposure in this piece of the market. So I, I think that uh, will be a, a, a very impactful insight and hopefully people will will, will, will see some of the other alternative uh, approaches. Um, want to switch gears a little bit, but you know, a lot of the work at RFK over the past few years in the domestic front has been around criminal justice reform. And one of the pieces that we, you know, kind of constantly see askew is the 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 treatment of people who get pulled into the the system in some way, you know, being kind of uniformly treated as synonymous with, you know, having been guilty of of something. So, uh, you know, the the easiest example is when we do uh, studies on on bail. You know, people seeing bail as being set as a way to protect the public as opposed to ensure that somebody shows up for for their trial. So there's there's a lot of misunderstanding, and it really caught caught my eye when you were describing on facial recognition. And, you know, I think you gave uh, an example of mugshots being used uh, as part of the training tool. And a mugshot, for those who aren't aware, is is a photo that's taken, you know, subsequent to an, an arrest, but prior to determination of innocence or guilt. And so there's all sorts of things that kind of get get construed or misconstrued. Um, and that, you know, it just led me down the the path of, of wanting to ask you about, you know, this facial recognition technology itself, you know, where do you see the, the biggest threats to society kind of given this uh, uh, ability um, that, that's there for artificial intelligence in terms of deployment, but this kind of similar need to feed the system and then feed that system with all of the you know, not not just the biases that come from the material, but the biases that come from the people deciding what kind of material and what kinds of takeaways from that material are going to then be embedded in the the algorithms going forward. Well, this is a really important area, and 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 certainly you will be seeing this trend too, and and feel the same concern I feel, which is the gradual encroachment and reliance upon AI systems in criminal justice at multiple points. Um, We could think about the way that AI systems have been used inside the courtroom to try and give a single number of risk, um, which was the objective of the compass system to defendants in all sorts of horrifying ways. It was shown to be based on a biased algorithm. We could think about the way that AI systems are being fed into police uh, cars as they sort of go around and sort of, you know, check out neighborhoods and they're being given heat maps to say, you know, check out this area based on previous crime. Well, we've also studied and shown how these are profound profoundly biased systems that are run by Palantir and others that have been shown to have enormous racial implications in terms of who receives, you know, the most surveillance and who is seen as somehow not a risk. Um, So again, you know, it's the same racialized logics that we've seen time and time again, but now being hard coded into technical systems that give the patina of neutrality, of objectivity of being something that you can't answer back to. And it's interesting to see that, you know, across the board, you know, from sentencing to uh, to the actual first contact with police, right, at any point in the system, also people who are sort of post bail, people who've kind of come out of the criminal justice system are still, you know, become, their data flags are kind of always there 
in these data systems. And so they, again, can't escape that type of like hyper data surveillance. And I, I will give, you know, mentions to key um, key studies here in the space. Also, Sarah Brain, who wrote a really important book looking at the use of, you know, large scale data systems and machine learning and policing. Also, the work of Ruha Benjamin, who's looked closely at sort of the racialized logics of these systems. We know they don't work. I mean, in short, we've had, you know, so you know, so much research that's pointed to this, but they keep getting sold and they keep getting bored. And now we're, we've reached a new stage where we've started to see Amazon sell things like ring cameras that you might have, you know, outside, you know, tracking if your parcels have arrived. But of course, those data feeds are all going to police departments around the country. It's become effectively a completely privatized surveillance network that many people aren't even aware that they're feeding into. So at every step of the way, we have to ask, you know, whose civic space is being defended here? Whose rights are being recognized? And what forms of discrimination, bias, or sort of racialized logics are being sort of essentially calcified into technical systems? And for me, in in my in my career, that's meant researching individual systems and showing where they're broken. It's meant studying the actual training data that's being used to make these systems. It's been studying the actual you know institutions that try to implement them. And you can see all along the chain how these problems emerge. So it, it's one of the things that I think we have to be most vigilant about is to prevent these things actually causing the erosion of human rights across the board. And you know, I don't, I don't think this comes heavily in the the book, but you do have a few places where you mention it. But the the homogeneity of the people who are designing the systems themselves, it, you know, I, I we we at least in the uh, investing space spend a lot of energy saying that you know the 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 diversity of the people who are making investment allocation decisions has a material impact on what the outcomes are and and yet you would think that you know for a group that is always chasing alpha that that would be all all that it took for people to to then have all sorts of behavior change but 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 yet it doesn't and university endowments are still you know somewhere around you know maybe at best 5% of the decision makers are people who are not white male over age 50 um and that's with this recognition, so I, I'm, I'm curious what what your observation from kind of the behind the curtain side. You know what 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 are the the kind of the teams or the demographics or lived experience of the the people involved in creating these systems, and how might that be either biasing or leading to a, a prioritization of how much concern there is about the various you know kind of bias that's 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 identified. This is a major problem. Um, it's it's certainly something that I've written about a lot in the past, um, uh, including a piece for the New York Times. Sort of, this was you know several years ago now, isolating that you know AI had a white guy problem, which is really that, that you know the people who are running these companies and in, in many cases, really running the engineering teams, like sitting in these rooms deciding how something will work and who it best serves, are really demographically narrow. Um, and again, as a woman in the AI space, you know, I've you know, many times been at conferences where there's, you know, I have to look around that just isn't another woman there, let alone a person of color. I mean, we can have all sorts of discussions around the sort of the demographic skews. You know, the skews are also around the institutions that people come from, um, particularly the computer science departments that heavily dominate where tech companies are hiring from. When, again, studies have shown over and over again that you need interdisciplinarity. You need people from different perspectives. You need computer scientists, social scientists, humanists working on these systems because otherwise, to take your criminal justice example, you'll have people saying, oh, let's make a, let's make a fairer algorithm for deciding who should get bail from people who've never worked in criminal justice, never been on the ground, and, and barely understand what bail is for. And now they're designing technical systems to try and intervene to make it fairer. This is, you know happening all the time. I should be clear, there are like multiple papers that cross my desk per year where people are trying to do this without any actual advice from expertise that is actually based in the system. So this is a major problem. There's also another way to look at this, which I write about in the book, which is those forms of skews of who's there can actually, again, become part of an AI system. And, and this actually happened at Amazon. So 
A few years ago, Amazon decided, because they get so many resumes from people who'd like to work there, that they wanted to create essentially an an automated resume scanner. It would look at all the resumes and tell them who to interview. So they build an AI system that was essentially scanning these systems, looking at all of the resumes, what are the sorts of things that would be a good employee, and then flagging those for interview. But they found out after about two years of running this that it didn't recommend a single woman. In fact, if you even had the word woman on your resume, for example, you know, coach of the women's soccer team, your resume would be put at the bottom of the pile. So why is this? Because, of course, the algorithm was modeled based on their existing engineering workforce, which is at that time, I think was over around 85% male. I mean, particularly, you know, if if you look specifically in the AI engineering parts of the company, it's even more heavily male dominated. So if you train the system on your existing workforce, you've basically got a bias generator. That's what you've built. That's what AI will do. It will replicate based on the existing pattern that you've given it. So there's something interesting that we could think about here, which is, you know, obviously that system didn't work. But what if we thought about that almost as a diagnostic machine, as a machine for saying, this is the problem with your existing workforce. This is the issue with the existing patterns of data that you're giving me, which is that we're seeing high high levels of homogeneity, essentially, you know, enormous gender disparity, disparity in terms of where people come from, in terms of what their training is. You could really use these systems in a much more forensic way to try and improve your own corporate practices. Haven't seen it done, but actually these systems are perfectly, almost exquisitely designed to achieve that. Um, And just a final point, I think, you know, in my experience of, of, you know, being in the technology industry for such a long time, I've seen those rooms change depending on who's in them. The minute you have, you know, people from different backgrounds, the minute you have women of color saying, you know, why are you designing a system that doesn't even recognize me? The moment you have people who come from different socioeconomic perspectives, different parts of the world, you immediately get better systems. You get richer conversations and you're creating with the sense of a more diverse user base in mind. And sometimes, hopefully, also thinking about the medium and long-term impacts of what you build. Excellent. Um, and I know we've talked a lot about kind of the domestic con- context, but I do want to ask, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, an, an even more autocratic environment and, you know, the emergence of, of Chinese tech companies that are engaged in kind of international agreements, uh, uh, provision of services and network uh, and, you know, maybe lower thresholds on on data privacy. You know, what what are the consequences in environments that you know are not concerned about the trade-offs because they're they're catering to a very kind of narrow uh, set of interests. You know what does does that look does that look different than it does in other places? Do we ultimately all get to the same place at just different times? Uh, are there you know are there things around uh, data harvesting and kind of security that you know should should be part of you know, kind of the the, the global organizations, treaties, discussions, you know, what 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 does that kind of varied international context in terms of of, of data kind of look like and mean in the context of, of AI evolution? Mm. Well, let me turn this question on its head a bit and say privacy is incredibly important, but we have utterly failed in the United States to come up with any strong omnibus federal protections for privacy. We've gone through the entire social media wave and seen so many forms of damage from like Cambridge Mm -hmm. Analytica to, you know, strong evidence of teen girls, you know, becoming suicidal because of the sort of information they're constantly being fed algorithmically through Instagram. So many issues around the way that our data has been used and weaponized against us. And we still don't have basic privacy protections in the United States. So now let's talk about China. Interestingly, China has extremely strong domestic privacy laws. So that's for people inside China. It's actually harmonized to match the EU. So interestingly, you're better off from a privacy perspective in China right now than you are in the United States. And that is shameful. We should be doing so much better. It is truly one of the greatest abrogations that we've had in this country that we haven't recognized 
right to privacy and the importance of our data, how much it can illuminate about our lives and how easily we can be manipulated by people who have it. Unfortunately, though, when you look at the question of human rights more broadly, and also when you know China is running systems internationally, there's very little protection for that data at all. So again, because citizens in the United States are not very well protected, any other country that's running systems here can harvest that data extremely easily. And we should have a much higher level of concern about this now that that data is being fed into generative AI systems that can essentially create entire worldviews for you, give you answers that will, you know, again, shift your thinking in, in, in ways that we never saw under a more kind of complex information ecology that we had with search, this is really going to be a space of manipulation and and at the scale of which we have never seen before. I mean, deep fakes is just the beginning. So honestly, if I'm if I'm, if I'm going to tell you the things that keep me up at night, Michael, this is one of them that, you know, we so we so left privacy behind in the dust, honestly, well over a decade ago and never remedied it. We didn't remedy the serious social harms that came with social media. And on the looks of last week with both the UK summit and Biden's executive order on AI, we don't have the muscle to do anything about it for AI either. So we're really setting up the ground conditions for something very dramatic to happen before we put in the most desperately needed guardrails. This is the thing that, you know, many of us have been saying for a long time and saying it increasingly loudly, the human rights issue of our time is going to be how these systems are actually put into guardrails. If we fail, it's going to affect everything from national security to, you know, your ability to trust whether that email came from your bank or not. Every element of life will be impacted by AI systems. And, and I can't overstate this enough. We are underplaying just how significant a change is happening right now. And that means we need much stronger regulatory protection. Well, well I'm, I'm going to switch to some questions that came in while we were talking and uh, hopefully we'll, you know, the, some of these may have, have been addressed, but in the, the real time nature, I'm sure there's uh uh, other angles, but uh, we had a question that said, uh, Kate, you are a part of a growing group of scholars and activists who are exploring significant questions about labor, data, and inequality. Could you identify one question or dilemma at the intersection of these subjects, that's labor, data, and inequality, that you believe demands more sustained inquiry and effort to build our understanding of? Just one? Okay, that's you know you're, you're making it tough for me today, but but you know I appreciate that, and 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 I'm going to speak to something that that actually Michael and I were discussing just before um, our book club began, and something that's really close to my heart is what's going to happen to forms of creative human labor that are now being seen as easily automated. So here we could think about everything from you know the film industry to publishing, to music, to so many of these domains that we thought were only ever the preserve of humans and, and, and human creativity, now being automated. Now, we're already starting to see a softening in the labor market for all of these types of activities from, you know, storyboarding, website production, programming, uh, any type of like work for hire, writing and editing, these jobs are disappearing. And that's just the beginning. That's just at the edges. I th I'm worried that we're going to see quite a substantial labor collapse in a set of these segments, particularly the segments that are you know, facing the, the, the greatest applicability of generative AI. What that's going to do to inequality and what it's going to do is going to be extremely rapid division. And again, depending which economists you believe right now, we're looking at something that could happen in the next 24 months. But at the outside, we're looking at really sort of four to five years a complete shifting of what the labor market looks like. And long before these kinds of technologies can replace jobs with, with new things, again, we talked about click work, um, you know, the doomsday scenario is that all of those people who had jobs and, and particularly, you know, jobs in the creative industries move to becoming, you know, data click workers. I mean, that's the kind of work that's being created right now, deeply underpaid, you know, underprotected work. So this is something that, you know, I'm researching at the moment. It's something that I think, you know, is, is deeply, deeply important because in so many ways, 
this is how we value what we do. And, and, and creativity can sometimes sound like mm, too grand or, or poetic a word, but in the end, we all write things. We all, you know, say things. We all, you know, listen to things that we care about. All of these acts of, of human interpretation and production, these are all creative acts too that are being hoovered up into these data sets and in many cases, you know, turned into proprietary systems or in other cases, you know, weaponized or in other cases used as kind of advertising systems to cause ways for you to, you know, buy yet more products. I think this is a really fundamental human capacity that is now being seriously undervalued with a whole range of knock-on effects for labor, for, you know, entire economic systems and for how we understand ourselves. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that, that I, we have time for one last audience question and then we'll, we'll, we'll ask for kind of closing and wrap up and then go back to Fanta for the, for the very final uh, word. Um, but so the, the last question I have in here is uh, uh, thank you for the book, which uh, provides so much deep analysis of how we got here. Um, we're very interested to hear your thoughts on how we can get out of here. Are there some specific recommendations that you have on how we might prevent some of the negative situations caused by AI as currently deployed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I think there's, there's three that we could touch on here. There are regulatory approaches. So this is something that I've worked on for a long time and, and published many white papers and advised various governments on how to address. Um, of course, there's also a competing pressure on many governments right now to not regulate. And often that pressure is coming from the richest people on the planet saying, you know, don't tie our hands, you know, we want to create more innovation. Um, when at the same time, you know, we're seeing particularly the most marginalized in our communities, the people with the least are actually facing the greatest risk from these systems. That is exactly the moment where regulators should step in. We have to think about the good of all and not enriching the few. So to me, that means I'm looking very closely right now, spending a lot of time looking at the uh, EU's AI Act. It's currently going through its last processes of dialogue and decision called the Trilogues. Um, in theory, that should be passing by the end of this year. It's not incredibly rigorous and not incredibly strong, but it does at least shine a spotlight on how we might start to regulate AI specifically. That is something that I think the US has shown at least an interest in. I think if we have to give um, a real nod to Biden's executive order, he has raised up a set of issues that really hadn't been thought of together. Um, I'd like to see some more strength backstopping that. I would like to see it actually encoded in law, because as we know, executive orders can disappear with the, with the shifting of an election. But we certainly are starting to see those conversations. The second big area, honestly, is how we as people are going to accept and perhaps refuse these systems. It's almost exercising that that muscle, that atrophied muscle of saying, maybe I don't need this, you know, tech gadget in my house. Maybe I don't need to use LLMs for everything in my world. Maybe there are actually things that I can do better myself than I can try and rely on a, you know, large language AI model to try and do for me. Developing a, a skepticism, a questioning, and a type of, you know, sense of what things are appropriate to be used when. Developing that kind of capacity, I think, is something that, that we can really do that's really important. And then finally, um, I think it's really important to see the way that unions have been organizing around this question. And um, certainly this has been the year, the first year of major AI strikes. And, you know, the Hollywood Writers Guild and now, of course, the Actors Guild are really thinking about the longer term implications of their work and how they could be you know, profoundly undermined by systems that could easily just generate their voice or their face and they will never need to be in that film again. Neither will they actually have any consent about how you know their voice, their persona is being used. Same goes for writers. Um, we're really looking at a type of replication model um, that is, you know, deeply concerning. And, and, and I think this is something that unions are, are understanding and are doing extraordinary work in bringing people together and saying, how do you want to use these systems? Are you concerned about this? What are the parameters that would respect 
what we do and allow us to have fulfilling lives going forward. You know, that is something that I think is core to the mission. So they're the big three that I would say. Um, Certainly, you know, for me, I think as someone who's been you know, really focusing on these questions around human rights, equity, and AI for a long time, I still think it's really important that we drive research, that we ask those hard questions. But now it's about all of us working together because we are in this and we're in an extraordinary inflection point. And I think the implications will be very far reaching. Well, that is a far better ending than ChatGPT would have written for us. Uh, <laughs> so far. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> thank you for that. And I think it, it really reinforces the things that I, I believe that the, the network who is on this call are, are very interested in is, you know, what are the, the, the levers in between the, you know, kind of individual uh, agency to be able to say, say no. And certainly if I, I look at the world of trans fats and packaged goods, that was a, a place where people's behavior and preference and the tolerance for the direction that was going to make it ever cheaper and more uh, processed, you know, really has kind of changed the industry. So hopefully, you know, individual agency there, certainly regulation. And I think the EU uh, has has been a, a, a huge impact. And um, when we look at the ESG pathway, you know, many of the, the kind of most dynamic behavior changes, not because people are worried about the SEC, it's because they run a global enterprise and they have to conform with EU legislation. And so hopefully this again kind of helps helps on the regulatory front push the, the United States along. Um, and then the unions and organization, I think, uh, you know, the world the world is different for labor, but not necessarily any better for labor. And so uh, there, there needs to be that kind of continued vigilance. And I think not just the actors and writers, but I know that AI was part of the, the kind of impetus in some elements of the GM negotiations as well. And so I think this is, is kind of moving you know, kind of throughout the, the the labor movement broadly. So, thank you for for providing those three concrete uh, elements. And you know, I do want to give you a, a chance for anything that we didn't cover, or anything that you'd like to to kind of conclude uh, our conversation with. Well, just to say, it's been lovely to join you, Michael, and I, and I'm really glad that the foundation is looking at these questions. We really are, I think, in, in some ways, facing such a set of of simultaneous shifts. Um, I think about, you know, what happened with Spotify and the impact of, you know, one, one technology on one industry, which really upending all of the economic paradigms that have been related to music. Now think about generative AI, doing that to every industry you can name that uses human cognitive labor from, you know, lawyers to film directors, everybody is looking at having to shift how they work and in many cases losing their ability to say, no, I want to create things this way. And in some cases, you know, I'm thinking here of medical professionals being asked to use systems that, you know, can actually cause harm. So we're at an extremely tentative and I think, you know, concerning moment that these systems are being implemented at scale before they've been rigorously tested and before we've had these types of backstops, both technical and regulatory, put into place. So it really is a moment for civil society to step up, to start, you know, waving some signs saying, this is enough. And, you know, we we currently see the Elon Musks of this world, you know, sitting down with world leaders. I would like to see more of a civil society presence really starting to say, enough is enough. We actually have to make sure that we protect the world's population, not just the world's elite. So that would be my last thought. Um, and I'd love to see uh, and hear from the people on the call. If there are any follow-up questions you have, feel free to reach me. Um, of course, Michael has my details, but I'm here if there are any questions you'd like to follow up with. Perfect. Thank you, Professor Crawford. And certainly for, for those on the call, any questions that we get in, we'll, we'll consolidate and we'll make sure that uh, we we circle back. And uh, I know that I'll be turning over to, to Fanta, who put in a plug. But if you didn't get enough of your AI fill, we do have a, a Compass, an RFK Compass event that, uh, though themed towards the investment landscape, uh, is is going to be focused on artificial intelligence. Um, and that's coming up in, in New York on November 30th. So uh, we we'll hope that anybody who has that interest is, is, is able is to join us. And I'm going to turn it back over to, to Fanta. But thank you, Professor Crawford. And thank you for everybody who joined us today. Thanks so much, Michael. Thanks, everyone. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. That was such an amazing and powerful discussion. So thank you so much, Kate, um, for your insights and Michael for really driving that that conversation. Um, we went from how AI tools are developed to inequities and in AI models and uses to politics and the roles of regulators and the power of organizing to data privacy globally compared to the US. Kate, I for sure learned so much in that past hour and look forward to seeing more of your thought leadership around this AI growth and boom that we are witnessing. Um, your work is truly an atlas of information that everyone should read to better understand how AI fits into our world. Um, to our viewers, we appreciate your time with us today as we navigated the implications of AI. For those of you who are streaming online, the book Atlas of AI by Craig Crawford is available in all major sellers. To learn more about RFK Human Rights, visit our website or any of our social media platforms and keep an eye out for our next book club meeting. As Michael mentioned, um, if today's session on AI caught your attention, you want to dive a little bit deeper, be sure to email us to join us on November 30th in New York City for our fall summit on AI ethics and investments. Thank you so much and see you all soon.